Uh, welcome to February and welcome to this afternoon's review session. Are we ready to go, Ryan? Uh, the stream is live and we're ready to go. Um, so this is the City Planning Commission review session on Monday, February 1st, 2021. The time is one o'clock p.m. and a quorum is present. Uh, the first item on our agenda is a certification of a zoning map and zoning text amendments and a special permit in Brooklyn Community District 9. Our presenter is Jonah Rogoff. And before Jonah begins his comments, I want to note for the commissioners, for the commission, that as you know, when an application is complete, it's the practice of the department to certify it. But as I'll explain in far more detail after Jonah makes his presentation, the department does not support this application. Great, thanks Marisa. Good afternoon, commissioners. So this is an application by Franklin Avenue Acquisition LLC for a zoning map amendment from an R6A district to an R9D district and an R9D district with a C2-4 commercial overlay, a special permit for a large scale general development to modify base height tower and lot coverage requirements, a special permit to reduce the residential parking requirement and a zoning text amendment to map an MIH area in order to facilitate the development of two 39 story towers, totaling 1.16 million square feet with 1,578 units, approximately 20,000 square feet of commercial and 9,000 square feet of community facility space located in the Crown Heights neighborhood of Brooklyn within community district nine. Next slide. The surrounding area is generally characterized by multifamily residential buildings, public facilities and institutions, and commercial uses. Residential uses are concentrated on the mid blocks and avenues, while commercial uses are located along Franklin Avenue to the north, Bedford and Rogers Avenues to the east, and Empire Boulevard to the south. Medgar Evers College is located to the east, as well as Jackie Robinson Playground, and the Brooklyn Botanic Garden is one block to the west. Residential and mixed use buildings consist primarily of pre-war mid-rise apartment buildings ranging in height from two to six stories. The surrounding area also contains a few residential towers built under height factor zoning, including the 33 story, 335 foot tall Tivoli towers, one block north and the Ebbetsfield apartment complex consisting of seven 25 story, 258 foot tall buildings located one block east. The project area and the majority of the surrounding area are mapped with R6, R6A, R7-1, R8A, and R8X zoning districts with commercial overlays mapped along the avenues. To the west and south of the project area is an R8A contextual district, which permits a maximum residential FAR of 6.02, base heights between 60 and 85 feet, and a building height up to 125 feet. Directly to the north is an R8X and an R8X district with a C2-4 commercial overlay, which was mapped in 2018 as part of a private application. R8X is a contextual district that permits a maximum residential FAR of 7.2 within an MIH area, base heights between 60 and 105 feet and building heights up to, up to 175 feet. The project area in large portions of Franklin Avenue are mapped with an R6A contextual district, which permits a maximum residential FAR of three, base heights between 40 and 65 feet, and building heights up to 75 feet. Next slide. The area is within the transit zone and served by a few public transit options. The two, three, four, and five subway lines, as well as the Franklin Avenue shuttle, have stops at Franklin Avenue and Eastern Parkway roughly five blocks north of the project area. The B, Q and Franklin Avenue shuttle lines can also be accessed at the Prospect Park subway station, three blocks south of the project area. Several bus lines run nearby, including the B48, which stops along Franklin Avenue next to the site. Next slide. The project area encompasses the R6A zoned area on the Eastern portion of block 1192, generally bounded by Montgomery Street to the north Franklin Avenue to the east, Sullivan Place to the south, and Washington Avenue and the Franklin Avenue shuttle right of way to the west. The project area is comprised of eight tax lots, including the development site 
on lots 41, 46, 63, and 66, and smaller portions of lots 1, 77, and 85, which are not owned by the applicant. Next slide. To help illustrate the project area and its context, here's a bird's eye view with the project area outlined in blue and the development site shaded in red. The non-applicant owned lots and the remaining lots on the block mainly consist of existing six to eight story apartment buildings, while a portion of the project area overlaps with a below grade open air rail cut that serves as a right of way for the MTA's Franklin Avenue shuttle. The Brooklyn Botanic Garden is located to the west on just directly on the other side of Washington Avenue. The development site contains a total of approximately 120,000 square feet, 2.76 acres with, one, with 220 feet of frontage along Montgomery Street and 576 feet of frontage along Franklin Avenue. Both Franklin Avenue and Montgomery Streets are 70 foot wide narrow streets per zoning. The northern portion of the development site comprised of lots 41 and 46 consists of a cluster of former manufacturing, warehousing and office buildings that were, previous, that were primarily used for the storage and processing of spices, a portion of which is still actively used today. The southern portion of the development site comprised of lots 63 and 66 contained a vacant lot and one story warehouse. Next slide. The top left photo shows a view of the northern part of the site. And that on the top right is a view directly north of the site, which was rezoned as part of the 2018 private application. The bottom left photo shows Franklin Avenue with the Tivoli Towers apartments in the background. Next slide. Here's a view of the top left uh, showing the site's Franklin Avenue frontage and the storage building use for spices. And then on the top right is the Jackie Robinson playground located across the street. On the bottom left is a view of Montgomery Street looking east with the Ebbets Field apartment complex in the background. Next slide. <laughs> Lastly, just a few more views looking east showing the southern part of the development site with the adjacent apartment building to the south. Next slide. The proposed development would consist of two mixed use buildings totaling approximately 1.15 million square feet of floor area or 9.7 FAR, including 1.1 million square feet of residential or 1,570 total units of which 30% or 474 units would be subject to MIH and an additional 20% or 315 units the applicant intends to set aside for middle income housing bringing the total project's total affordable units to 50%. The proposed development would also contain 20,000 square feet of commercial, 9,000 square feet of community facility use intended to serve as a daycare center, two parking garages accommodating 180 spaces and a publicly accessible area located in the center of the site. Next slide. The project is proposed to be constructed as two separate buildings in two phases, consisting of building one on the southern portion and then building two on the northern portion, which would be divided by a 73 foot wide central court and driveway that provides internal circulation and access to the residential building entrances, as well as an open area with a few public realm design elements. Next slide. Here's an exonometric view to help show the proposed built form and massing. Building one would have a six story and seven story street wall along Franklin Avenue. The building would then set back 15 feet before rising to 17 stories and then set back another five feet before rising to 34 stories. After which there would be an 85 foot setback before rising to 39 stories with a building height of 421 feet. Building two would have an eight story street wall along Franklin Avenue and Montgomery Street. The building would then set back 15 feet before rising to 17 stories, followed by a 90 foot setback before rising to 34 stories. Another 85 foot setback is proposed along Montgomery Street 
before the building reaches 39 stories with a height of 421 feet. The widths of each tower would vary by building segment, ranging from 485 feet to 210 feet in length. Next slide. And just to further illustrate the proposed building massings, here's a, an elevation uh, showing the Franklin Avenue frontage and the attempts to articulate the street wall with various setbacks and tower portions of each building. Next slide. And then zooming out, here's a view of the previous elevation in the context of buildings on neighboring blocks as part of the neighborhood character diagram. The proposed development is shown in the center, which at 428, 421 feet tall would be significantly taller than the four to six story buildings on other portions of Franklin Avenue, as well as Tivoli Towers and the Ebbets Field apartment complex. Next slide. And then turning the focus back to the development's ground floor plan, the applicant also proposes a publicly accessible area or PAA located in the central court and driveway. This area would have planters, benches and other public realm amenities and would be subject to certain hours of operations and maintenance standards. Next slide. Here's a rendering showing a pedestrian level perspective of the Franklin Avenue frontage with retail extending along the avenue. I'd also like to note that the entrance to the community facilities is proposed to be on the northern end of the site along Montgomery Street and is intended to be tenanted with a daycare center, which would also serve to partially mitigate um, an impact to publicly funded child care facilities identified in the draft environmental impact statement or DEIS. Next slide. To facilitate the proposed development, the applicant seeks four land use actions, a zoning map amendment, two special permits related to a large scale general development and waiver to reduce off street residential parking, and a zoning text amendment to map a mandatory inclusionary housing area or MIH area. Next slide. First, the applicant requests a zoning map amendment to rezone an R6A district to an R9D district over the eastern portion of the block and map a C2-4 commercial overlay within 100 feet of Franklin Avenue. Next slide. R9D is a high density residential district that allows up to 10 FAR when mapped with an MIH area. Created as part of a 2009 area-wide rezoning near Yankee Stadium in the Bronx, R9D districts are intended to be mapped adjacent to elevated transit lines in order to allow buildings to set back from the street. In R9D districts, sites adjacent to an elevated train must maintain a, maintain a base height between zero to 25 feet. Otherwise, base heights can be between 60 and 85 feet. While R9D districts do not have a maximum building height, buildings over 85 feet must comply with tower regulations. Off-street parking is generally required for 40% of the market rate dwelling units and optional for income restricted housing units within the transit zone. The C2-4 overlay would permit a maximum commercial FAR of two and allows a, a range of local retail uses, including grocery stores, restaurants, and laundromats, all with low parking requirements. Next slide. The second action requested is a special permit pursuant to a large scale general development. Specifically, the applicant is seeking three waivers. First, a waiver to increase the permitted base height by 10 feet in building two, which would wrap around the frontage shown in the dark blue shading. Second, a waiver to allow the lock coverage of the towers above 85 feet to be between five and 44% rather than between 33 and 40% required by the underlying R9D regulations. Third, a waiver to allow the tower's highest four floors to have full coverage, rather than have a coverage of 50 to 80% of the story immediately below those stories. Lastly, the special permit would also memorialize a bulk envelope aligned with the proposed massing and setbacks, along with requirements to screen the bulkheads and incorporate recesses along the street walls. According to the applicant, 
the waivers would result in a better site plan and relationship between buildings, streets, and open spaces. In particular, the applicant seeks a base height waiver to better align the street wall of building two with the street wall allowed to the north in the R8X district. While the tower coverage waivers are requested to add bulk flexibility and set back the proposed tower massings from the street. Next slide. The third action requested is a special permit to reduce the required off-street residential parking for non-income restricted housing units in relation to facilitating the development of affordable housing. The applicant proposes to reduce the required parking from 442 to 128 spaces. Next slide. The fourth and final action requested is a zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area with options one and two coterminous with the project area. The applicant intends to select option two, which requires 30% of the residential floor area at an average of 80% of the area median income or AMI or below. Among the project's total of 1,578 units, 474 or 30% would be subject to MIH. As mentioned earlier, the applicant also intends to provide an additional 315 units or 20% of the total as middle income housing, which the applicant intends to be financially supported by the housing trust of the AFL-CIO labor union, as well as state-based housing programs. Next slide. As part of the application materials, a draft environmental impact statement or DEIS has been completed and a notice was issued on January 29th, 2021. The DEIS identified significant adverse impacts with respect to community facilities and services on the topic of childcare, open space shadows and natural resources, which are related to the Brooklyn Botanic Garden and the Jackie Robinson Playground, transportation as it relates to traffic and the pedestrian analyses, and construction as they relate to transportation and noise. No other significant adverse impacts were identified and mitigation measures are identified in the DEIS and will be explored further in the FEIS. Next slide. So with respect to the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, department staff would just like to share a little background on the DEIS's shadow analysis, which did identify significant adverse impacts due to direct shadow effects on open and natural resources particularly during morning hours. In particular, we'd like to call attention to the 22 sunlight sensitive facilities shown in the slide above, which includes conservatories, greenhouses, propagation spaces and nurseries, which are clustered along the garden's Eastern boundary. These facilities contain over 18,500 kinds of plants, many of which require full year round sunlight and six to eight hours or more of direct sunlight per day. Next slide. And just in an effort to help visualize this, uh, we'd like to show a few analysis maps taken from the DEIS. So from the, for the March 21st and September 21st analysis days, the incremental shadow back would last for three hours and five minutes from 7.36 to 10.41 a.m. Next slide. And then for the May 6 and August 6 analysis days, the incremental shadow would last for four hours and two minutes from 627 to 1029 AM. Next slide. And then for the December 21st analysis date, the incremental shadow would last for one hour and 54 minutes from 851 to 1045 AM. The June 21st analysis period, along with a more detailed shadow analysis of individual facilities and the Jackie Robinson playground can be found in the full DEIS. Next slide. So that concludes our presentation. I'm happy to take any questions and I'll turn it over to the chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before opening it up to questions from the commission, I want to note that while the department supports opportunities for housing growth and affordable housing especially, 
these goals have to be balanced by the appropriate building form and scale for the location. So on this topic, I wanna to note the department's deep concerns with the project's bulk, tower width, and overall massing. R9D, as Jonah had explained, is a zoning district that's intended to be mapped in high density areas, along wide streets, and adjacent to elevated train lines. Specifically, C63D, which is R9D's commercial district equivalent, is mapped along River Avenue and, 100, and east of 161st Street by Yankee Stadium in the Bronx, immediately adjacent to three subway lines and a Metro North station. 960 Franklin Avenue presents none of these conditions. The site is located on narrow streets over a quarter mile from a subway station. Further, the proposed FAR of 9.7 is comparable to high density areas like downtown Brooklyn and parts of Manhattan, a far cry from Crown Heights. Additionally, the resulting building forms produced by the private applicants proposed zoning district create a bulky base and a set of towers that are not sufficiently differentiated or articulated. Simply put, the private applicant is seeking way too much density for this site, leading to an overbearing envelope with no precedent and a development that's grossly out of scale with the surrounding context. I'll also call out that the private applicant's draft EIS contains a shadow analysis that demonstrates that the height and bulk of the towers would result in a significant, adverse, and unmitigated shadows impact on the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens greenhouses. These are unique and sensitive resources that are used to propagate plants and require full year-round sun, including sunlight during the winter months. Although the department finds that the application is technically complete and thus ready to certify, I want to assure the commission that department staff have repeatedly conveyed these concerns to the private applicant throughout the pre-certification process. Concerns that were recently echoed by the mayor. As the project enters public review, we look forward to the comments and recommendations from the community board borough president and other stakeholders. But let me be clear, the department does not support this private application. And with that, I turn it over to the commissioners for questions. Commissioner Dweck. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. No, I, I believe you've said it all. Um, I, I raised my hand prior to your comments, but I, I'd like to <clears throat> join in with you on the comments. And uh, if anything, I mean, this looks to me more appropriate as an R8A. And just to correct it, uh, Jonah, the R8A is a 6.02, uh, but in with MIH, it would become a 7.2. And that surrounding area certainly implies that this project would be a maximum of an R8A. So I concur with the comments of the chair. Other raised hands. Vice Chair Knuckles. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm just wondering how many uh, units would be yield, yielded uh, under the, as of right, R8A zoning? Is there a calculation on that? Uh, Commissioner, I don't have the exact number offhand. I'd like to get back to you on that. Um, just to clarify, the as of right would be R6A. So, uh, yeah. R6A, okay. But it would be a reduction from 9.7 FAR to 7.2. Under the R8A, yes, right. So about- With uh, MIH. That's correct. Right. Well, I'd be interested in, in, in the, the number just to, just to know it under an R8A scenario. Thank you. And, and Ken, I'll chime in just, that'll be with a re significant reduction in height also under an R8A. Which right. is most important. Right. right. Okay. Commissioner Bernie. Yes, I, I had pretty much the same question actually, Jonas. Did, did the department at any point model what an as of right development here would look like in terms of bulk and massing? I need to check with we did we have been working closely with our urban design urban designers. Um, uh, we haven't taken a close look at, it, but let me let me get back to you on that. Thank you. Commissioner Eady. Hi, thanks again. Um, what is the FAR um, on Tivoli Towers and Ebbets Field Apartments? Do we have that information for comparison? I'm sorry, Commissioner, can you repeat that question? I'm sorry. Do we know 
what the density is, the FAR used on the uh, Ebbets Field apartments and the Tivoli um, towers? Those were built, for, uh, they were built pursuant to height factor under R7, uh, one or R72, I believe. Um, I need to check, but I believe that they maxed out those FARs. Um, they, it's calculated based on the amount of open space provided, um, but I believe it's roughly three point, I want to say 3.4. Four. I know that that's consistent with the fact that frequently NYCHA campuses are the taller buildings in neighborhoods, but they tend to be relatively not dense because of the large yeah. amount of open space around the towers. But we Agreed, get... no, understood. That's, that was partly my point I wanted to make, is that those are much lower density, even though they are relatively tall buildings. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, thank you. And, and also along the lines of Tivoli Towers, do we know, I mean, they're in a different location, are they? Um, having the same shadow or similar shadow impacts um, owing to their height on the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens? No, so Tivoli Towers, they're, I would say that the, the distance is greater from the gardens, um, but also the width of the towers are much narrower than what the applicants proposing in 960 Franklin. Um, we, I don't have uh, a model of that, but you know, if that's something that would be helpful, we can take a closer look. No, I think I think that's the point that was important to make. Thank you. Any other comments from the commission? Yes, Commissioner Levin. Well, I guess I'm sort of sitting here quietly because mostly I agree with the comments that the chair has articulated. I got to say, I have never seen um, an environmental impact statement with such a stark scary description of um, the open space impacts here, not only on the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, those are the really the eye-catching ones here, but also on the um, playground. And you know the whole purpose of this environmental review, I guess, is now being revealed, which is that we as decision makers are supposed to look at what the impacts are and decide what to do about them. Um, this is really the first time I can remember sitting on this commission where I'm confronted with information in EIS that suggests that this should just be a non-starter. But the point of the Euler process is to let the public tell us what we think before we say what we think. Um, so this is gonna be a robust um, public process. Um, I go into it with a deep amount of skepticism um, based on the environmental impacts, but also about the housing program. Um, I mean, in my view, the um, environmental impacts might just stop this before we go any further. But I have a host of questions about the voluntary affordable component, how it can be made binding um, and how it would be implemented um, and whether there would be truly equitable housing throughout the development. But that in my mind is a detail um, stacked up against the environmental concerns and the urban design concerns that the chair has already expressed. Thank you. And again, to assure the commissioners, these have been expressed to the applicant throughout the pre-certification process. Other comments? Okay, the application is certified. All right, the second item on the agenda is a certification of a special permit in Manhattan Community District 4. Our presenter is Nabila Malik. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, this is a private application by 311 West 42nd Street Associates, LLC, requesting a special permit to modify height. This is to allow a portion of the proposed building along West 43rd Street to rise to a height of approximately 89 feet at 314 West 43rd Street. The proposal would facilitate a 295,000 square foot mixed use building on a through lock on a through block site located within the special Clinton district and special Midtown district in Clinton Hell's Kitchen Community District 4, Manhattan. Next slide, please. 
Um, so you can see the site outlined in red straddles the Clinton Hell's Kitchen and Midtown neighborhoods and the special Clinton and Midtown districts. Most of the surrounding area is zoned commercial with C62 to the north and C64 to the south. To the west of the site is the more residential area of Clinton and to the east of the site is the more commercial area of Midtown. Immediately to the south of the to the south of the site is um, Port Authority, the Port Authority bus terminal. Um, the development site is primarily a through block parcel located west of 8th Avenue between um, West 42nd and 43rd streets with small interior lot portions on the east and west uh, portions of the site. The site contains three tax lots split between C62 and C64 zoning districts. Next slide. So now I'm going to walk you through a breakdown of the project site. Lot 25 highlighted in blue is improved within an existing 13 story, 62,000 square foot commercial building that was constructed in 1970. Next slide, please. Um, just, just some background on this, on this 1970 commercial building. Um, 1199 SEIU, the healthcare union was located here on lot 25. They will remain the fee owner of lots 25 and 41 with the applicant Taconic as the ground tenant. SEIU relocated offices to Times Square last July. And as some of you may know, there's a large mural um, at the existing building on lot 25. The applicant had determined that the mural was too fragile to preserve and relocate. So SEIU had the mural recreated by the artist's, um, the original artist's grandson at their new headquarters. And the replica of the mural is what is pictured on this slide here. Next slide, please. So lot 41 currently contains a surface parking lot with stackers with a total license capacity of 102 spaces. Lots 25 and 41 would be consolidated for the development of the proposed new building. Next slide, please. Lot 22 is improved with a five-story tenement building constructed in 1920 and containing commercial use on the ground floor and 14 residential units above. It will be preserved as part of the proposal and um, the proposed development will be using development rights from lot 22. Next slide, please. So because the development site involves multiple zoning districts and special districts with different sub areas, I have broken the site down into lot portions below um, to describe applicable regulations. So um, lot portion A is the portion of the development site beyond 150 feet of 8th Avenue um, along West 43rd Street. It's within a C62 district in the preservation area of the special Clinton district. The preservation area restricts the height of a building or portion of a building to no more than seven stories or 66 feet if located beyond 100 feet from a wide street. The special permit um, that is the subject of this application would modify this regulation. The special district also permits a maximum of 4.2 FAR in the preservation area and also requires that a minimum of 20% of the lot area must be usable landscaped open area for residents. Next slide, please. Lot portion B is the portion of the development site beyond 150 feet of 8th Avenue along West 42nd Street. And it's within a C64 district in perimeter area B and the 42nd Street perimeter area sub area one of the special Clinton district. This portion is not subject to the special permit and would be developed pursuant to the existing zoning regulations. The C64 zoning district and R10 equivalent permits a maximum FAR of 12 with voluntary inclusionary housing. 
a 40% tower lot coverage maximum is required pursuant to the underlying district tower regulations. Next slide. Lot portion C is the portion of the development site within 150 feet of 8th Avenue and is located within a C64 district in the 8th Avenue perimeter area of the Special Clinton District and also within the theater sub-district 8th Avenue corridor of the Special Midtown District. The maximum FAR allowed in this portion is 12 pursuant to the Special Midtown District regulations. This portion is also not subject to the special permit waiver and would be developed pursuant to the existing zoning regulations. Next slide, please. The proposed development consists of a mixed use building located on lots 25 and 41. In total, the proposed development would contain 295,000 square feet of floor area, including approximately 21,000 square feet of unused development rights from lot 22. The proposed development would contain 25,000 square feet of commercial use and 270,000 square feet of residential use with 321 residential units, 81 of which will be affordable to households with incomes ranging from 40 to 120% of the area median income. The development would also consist of two building segments separated by a rear yard equivalent with a minimum depth of 60 feet in the form of a landscaped garden, which would provide the required open space. The garden will be available for use by all residential tenants. The northern segment along West 43rd Street contains the northern half of lots 25 and 41 and the southern segment along West 42nd Street contains the southern half of lots 25, 41, and 22. Next slide, please. The southern portion of the proposed development is not subject to the special permit waiver and will be constructed pursuant to the current zoning regulations. It will have approximately 31 stories and as currently proposed, the illustrative building will rise to an approximate height of 399 feet with bulkhead. The tower will have a lot coverage of 23% of the entire development site. The southern building segment would contain approximately 244 residential units, 49 of which would be affordable to households with incomes ranging between 40 to 120% AMI. The ground floor and second floor of the southern portion of the building will contain retail uses and the building is also expected to contain additional amenity space on the second, fourth, and 31st stories. No changes are proposed for the lot 22 portion um, of the zoning lot, which is the tenement building. Next slide, please. The portion of the northern building segment within lot portion A would contain a total of 63,000 square feet with 54,000 square feet of residential use and 9,000 9, square feet of retail use. The northern building segment would contain approximately 77 residential units, 32 of which would be affordable, um, affordable housing. The portion of the northern building segment within lot portion A which is the subject of the requested special permit would contain seven stories and rise to a maximum height of 89 feet as opposed to the permitted 66 feet. The easternmost 25 feet of the northern building segment, lot portion C, is not subject to the requested modification and would rise to a maximum height of 66 feet consistent with applicable zoning controls. This element would serve as the residential entry to the proposed development. The ground floor of the northern building segment would also contain retail use with two entrances proposed along 43rd Street. A curb cut for vehicular access to a commercial loading dock would um, be located along 43rd Street at the western end of the development site. Next slide, please. The applicant seeks a special permit pursuant to the Special Clinton District Preservation Area regulations, 
that allow the CPC to modify height and setback requirements. The maximum height in the preservation area beyond 100 feet of a wide street is 66 feet and can be modified to a maximum of 99 feet. The applicant is proposing a height of 89 feet. As you can see in this section here, um, it's the dark gray shaded area that is being waived. The applicant indicates that the additional height facilitated by the requested waiver would allow for a retail base for the proposed development with an approximately 17 foot floor to ceiling height allow for additional floor of residential use and allow for a more generous floor to ceiling height for residential tenants than would otherwise be provided within the applicable height limits. Next slide, please. The applicant asserts that it has met the findings for this proposal as the heights being proposed for the Northern building segment are reflective of the varying heights of buildings along 43rd Street within the special Clinton preservation area. Along the north side of 43rd Street, building heights range from 10 to 208 feet. And along the south side of 43rd Street, building heights range from 44 to 99 feet. In particular, the northern building segment would replace an existing 193 foot tall building currently located on the development site with one that is approximately 104 feet shorter, improving access to light and air for this portion of the site. The applicant further notes that taken together, the combination of the lower building along 43rd Street and the tower along 42nd Street with the open garden in between would result in a distribution of bulk that permits adequate access to light and air. Next slide, please. The applicant is requesting a special permit to modify the special district height regulations to allow a portion of the proposed building along West 43rd Street to rise to a maximum height of 89 feet at 314 West 43rd Street. The proposal would facilitate a 295,000 square foot mixed use building. Thank you. Thank you, Nabila. Questions from the commission. Commissioner Levin. Um, yes, Nabila, congratula congratulations on a very elegant job of, of, of unpacking the very complicated um, zoning rules in the special Clinton district, particularly along these, you got not one, but two peripheral areas. So very nicely done. Um, has, I have two questions. Has the applicant been consulting, uh, previously discussed this proposal with community board four? And um, secondly, what, how, what programs are they using to achieve the affordable housing in the, the two buildings? I notice in particular that the one in the Northern building has a rather more affordable housing units than you know, proportionately typically we would see. How are they doing that? Sure, um, so the, the applicants have uh, consulted community board four um, they, they spoke to them as recently as October, um, and the, the board had, um, you know, particular questions about affordable housing, as well as, um, making sure that there was, um, appropriate loading available for the building. Um, in terms of the way they are doing the affordable housing, um, it's voluntary inclusionary housing and they're not seeking any subsidies. Um, and they're gonna do the affordable New York program option E. Okay, good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Vice Chair Knuckles. Thank you, I'm just curious. Uh, earlier in your present, uh, presentation, uh, you indicated a, a designated architect for the open space. I'm just wondering, is that the same architect that's designing the two buildings? Um, that's a good question. I actually don't know the details of, of who is designing the landscaped area, but I can find out if it's the same architects. Thank you. Commissioner Rumpershot. For the presentation, sticking with the landscape portion, uh, I just want to clarify, is that on top of the commercial, is there a commercial below it? I'm looking at slide nine in particular. I just want to get some clarification on that. 
Yes, that's correct. So the the open space is at a height of 23 feet. So basically there's a retail base and then the landscaped open areas on top, correct? And I'm just curious of, uh, and you did say 17 feet, they are allowing for the first floor, the ceiling height? Mm -hmm. All right, I'm just uh, curious of why they chose that particular height uh, for a commercial space. Um, okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, the application is certified. Thank you. All right, the third item on our agenda is a pre-hearing review of a zoning map and zoning text amendments in the Bronx Community District 4. Our presenter is Michael Cavalier. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is an application by Webster 1099 Realty LLC uh, for a project in Bronx Community District 4. Uh, the actions request in this case are a zoning map change and a zoning, zoning text amendment to map MIH. Next slide, please. Just as a reminder to the commission, the project is located in Bronx Community 4 uh, along uh, Webster Avenue, the western block front between East 166th Street and East 167th Street. The area immediately to the west, uh, which is at the top of the screen here, is an existing large R71 residential district. And the area immediately to the east, which is in the lower uh, portion of the screen and which includes the project site, is an existing M11 uh, district. Um, there, uh, as a reminder, there are a number of um, uh, uh, tran transportation assets in the area, apologies, um, including the SBX 41 that runs along Webster Avenue, uh, the SBS 6, which runs along 161st Street to the south, as well as um, a D uh, stop uh, just immediately to the west, about half a mile from here. Next slide, please. Again, uh, there are two actions requested in this case. Uh, the first is a zoning map change to rezone the area from an existing M11, R71, and R71 with a C14 overlay to an R7X uh, with a C24 overlay. Uh, just a reminder of subtlety here, while most of the site is an existing M11 uh, district, uh, given the 100 foot mapping from uh, Webster Avenue and the uh, smaller depth of the block here, uh, a slight sliver uh, at the back of the lot of about 10 feet captures the R71, R71, C14 at the back of the lot is uh, the reason for those. Next slide, please. Uh, and then uh, finally, the second requested action is a zoning text amendment to map uh, MIH uh, option one uh, over the area. Next slide, please. The uh, proposed actions would facilitate uh, the construction uh, as proposed of uh, two new residential buildings, building A and building B. Uh, these would total 238 residential units. They would also include some 30 parking spaces for proposed uh, commercial use, as well as 43 accessory parking spaces for the residences. Next slide, please. Uh, building A, here we have an elevation. Building A would rise to a total of nine feet, or I'm sorry, nine stories. Uh, and building B would rise to a total of 11 stories. The applicant team in this case is seeking ELLA financing for the project from HPD. As such, they are, would be providing 36 units for the formerly homeless with the remainder of the units um, spread across uh, six income bands ranging from 27% AMI to 77% AMI. The applicant is also proposing 30,000 square feet of ground floor commercial space as part of the development. Next slide, please. And so just quickly, here's a, a rendering um, looking towards the west. Um, you can see the proposed development in the middle. On the left is East 166th Street with Webster Avenue uh, running in front of it. And for context, um, in the back on the right is the existing Triborough um, Nursing Center. And on the left is the existing nine-story uh, supportive housing facility uh, just to the south of the proposed development site, um, south of 166th Street. Next slide, please. Bronx Community Board 4 uh, uh, voted to approve with modifications with 29 in favor and one against. Um, uh, the conditions that were attached to it were uh, one, utilizing the area median income averaging to maintain a wider range of uh, income bands, uh, to work with the board and the community to provide paid apprenticeships, 
to commit to local hiring to a local hiring plan and provide quarterly updates uh, to commit to hiring Bronx-based MWBEs, um, working with DHS and HPD to increase the set aside for those currently in shelters and committing to trainings uh, for how to submit to the Housing Connect lottery. Uh, the Bronx Borough President uh, also uh, recommended approval with modifications. Uh, those modifications were maintaining uh, the wider array of income bands, including at the higher levels, uh, up to the 77% as initially proposed, as well as increasing the share of three bedroom units to 10% and the combined two and three bedroom units to 40%. In both, both cases, um, the, uh, the proposal was about one to 2% shy of those um, percentages that the uh, BP laid out. Um, next slide, please. Uh, in the initial uh, review session, there were two questions asked by the commission. So I just wanted to address those quickly. Uh, the first question related to uh, building by building unit breakdown, um, which uh, is included here. Uh, building A uh, would total 90 units, um, two studio, 54 one bedroom units, 28 two bedroom, and uh, six three bedroom units. Uh, building B uh, would total um, 148 units, um, 10 studio, 78 one bedrooms, uh, 44 two bedrooms, and 16 three bedroom units. And then as relates to uh, potential uses um, for the, uh, the retail space, uh, I'll just note that the applicant will of course be available uh, to speak to this during the hearing on Wednesday, but did provide uh, clarification that they see this as um, potentially a medical use, a daycare type use, or a local retail use. And I believe that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions from the commission. Question. Questions from the commission. Vice Chair Knuckles. Thank you. Um, do you know whether or not uh, support services of uh, any kind are planned for um, this complex to assist or uh, support um, a portion of its population that may well, you know, need some kind of support. I don't think that's presumptuous, but uh, maybe it is. I don't know. Not at all. Um, I, I'm not aware of uh, any current plans for supportive services, but I will make sure that the applicant team is aware. And hopefully, they can address that during the hearing on Wednesday. All right. Thank you. Other questions. Okay, then we will see this item at our public hearing on Wednesday. All right, the fourth item on the agenda is a non euler post-referral review of a modification of a previously approved special permit and amendment to a restrictive declaration in Manhattan Community District 5. Our presenter is Adka Mohidin. Hi, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, this is a private application by uh, 712 Fifth Avenue LP for a minor modification to a previously approved special permit coming back to commission post referral. This application was previously presented and referred on December 14, 2020. Next slide, please. The proposal is for a minor modification to enable design changes to a publicly accessible atrium within a designated landmark building on Fifth Avenue in the Midtown neighborhood of Manhattan Community District 5. Next slide, please. The subject building, commonly known as 712 Fifth Avenue, is located on the corner of Fifth Avenue and West 56th Street and consists of a 50-story commercial building with retail on the first through fourth floors and office use on the fifth through 50th floors. So Fifth Avenue frontage is occupied by three buildings as seen in the image on the right. Two of these buildings are individually designated landmark structures. So Vizzoli building at 712 Fifth Avenue and the Cody building at 714 Fifth Avenue where the atrium is located. The third building is a five-story infill building at 716 Fifth Avenue. Next slide, please. The zoning lot is located in the Midtown neighborhood of Manhattan, which is the central business district characterized by large office buildings, department stores, and hotels. Next slide. The zoning lot is split between C53 and C5P zoning districts and is located within the Fifth Avenue subdistrict of the special Midtown district. 
Next slide, please. The subject building was developed in accordance with a special permit in 1986 pursuant to ZR section 74711. As part of the approval, a publicly accessible atrium was established to allow the public the, to view the historic Lily windows located on the Fifth Avenue facade of the Cody building. There were subsequent minor open modifications in 1987, 2004, and 2008. Next slide, please. As a result of these modifications, the existing atrium has viewing paths along its side to provide the public an opportunity to view the historic Lily windows. The image on the right shows the view of the Lily windows from the ground floor of the atrium looking towards Fifth Avenue. Next slide. These images provide a look inside the atrium and the viewing paths around it. Next slide, please. The images here show a close up of the windows depicting the interlocking vines and flowers as designed by the renowned French glass designer René Jules Lalique in 1912. Next slide, please. The proposed redesign of the atrium will re-establish the demising wall between the Cody building and the Info building. As a result, the northern viewing paths will be removed and the existing ADA compliant elevator will be relocated next to the atrium within the Cody building. This would allow Harry Winston, currently located at 718 Fifth Avenue, shown in gray, to lease and occupy space in the 716 Fifth Avenue Info building by internally connecting the two buildings. Next slide. The proposed redesign will also remove two catwalks that pass in front of the Lilik windows on the third and fourth floors and reconstruct the second floor catwalk to be ADA accessible. Internal lighting and signage will also be updated. Next slide, please. As you can see in these renderings, comparing the existing and proposed atrium view, the removal of the third and fourth floor catwalks and reconstruction of the second floor catwalk with thinner and more translucent material would increase the visibility of the windows from the atrium's ground level and improve the public's space. Next slide. The Landmarks Preservation Commission reviewed the proposal as well and issued a certificate of no effect for the interior improvements and a permit for minor work for an updated exterior pop signage. Next slide. This application was referred out for 45 days on December 14, 2020. On January 14, 2021, Community Board 5 voted to approve the application with a vote count of 39 in favor and one abstaining. Next slide, please. In summary, the applicant is seeking approval of a minor modification to make interior design changes. This is a minor modification because the proposed modifications would not affect the basis of the previous CPC approvals or the findings made at the time of the original special permit. The proposal is brought to the commission because the proposed modifications change the approved plans, which can only be achieved through a minor modification. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your time and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Oscar. Questions from the commission? Okay, then I will ask for a approval to send a letter to the buildings department, letting them know that we have deemed this a minor modification. All in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay, we'll send the letter. Aye. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so the fifth item on the agenda is a non euler post referral review of an authorization in Manhattan Community District 5. Our presenter is Connor Clark. Connor, we can't hear you. Stephen, would you be yes. up to do this? Yes, I am right here. Thank you. This is Stephen Johnson from the Manhattan office. Um, this is a private application by East 16th Street owner LLC, which seeks an authorization to renew a parking special permit for a 196 space public parking garage at 110 East 16th Street located a half block east of Union Square Park, in Manhattan Community District 5. The application was referred to the Community Board on December 14th, 2020, and is back to the CPC for a vote. The authorization allows a non-conforming uses that were granted before the implementation of the 1961 zoning resolution to be extended for a period up to 10 years. 
the applicant initially requested a five-year renewal to be consistent with the previous five-year renewal. Uh, prior to this review session, they refiled their application and are now seeking a 10-year renewal. The applicant plans to develop the site and has obtained two, previously obtained two special permits to do so, but the current economic conditions have stalled the project. Uh, the Manhattan office supports the change to a 10-year renewal, and it is also consistent with the standard six, section 114411 renewal. Next slide, please. The 196 space garage, which is outlined in red on the map, is located between Union Square East and Irving Place. The development site is the zoning lot that encompasses lots 74 and 10, outlined in the white dotted line on the map. In 1960, the City Planning Commission issued a special permit for the operation of an eight-story garage on lot 74. The special permit has been renewed four times since, most recently in 2017, for a term of five years. Uh, the 2017 five-year renewal expires on March 9th. Next slide, please. The area map shows the development site is located in the C6 2A contextual zoning district, and it is surrounded by a mix of uses. Next slide, please. These photos show the entrances uh, to the garage with the fabric screening on top. Next slide, please. Uh, the site plan shows the development site with the garage located on the lot on the right side of the slide. The garage has a 10 foot wide curb cut and a 35 foot wide curb cut providing access to multiple access lanes. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the parking plan with the ground floor on the left and second floor on the right. It is an attended facility with two elevators. Next slide, please. And uh, this is the community board referral. CB5 reviewed the application and approved it unanimously on January 14th. During this presentation at this meeting, the applicant representative clearly indicated that the application would be changed from a five-year to a 10-year renewal. During the discussion, the community board five chair reiterated this change and there were no objections, but they voted on the proposal as it was originally filed. Next slide, please. And this is the zoning resolution text related to the authorization, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks for filling in, Stephen. Hello, can you guys hear me now? Yes, we can. So okay. Great. Questions. All right. I can answer questions or Steve can. Any questions? Okay. It looks like you're off the hook, Connor. And All right. uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. No worries. <laughs> um, and we will be scheduling this for a vote. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the sixth item on the agenda is a pre hearing review of a zoning map and zoning text amendments in Manhattan Community District 1. Our presenter is Allison Brown. Good afternoon, Commissioners. The Trust for Governors Island, known as the Trust, and the Department of Small Business Services seek a zoning map amendment and zoning text amendment. This project was first presented to the Commission and referred to the public on October 19th, 2020. Today, I'll provide a very brief recap of the proposed actions as previously discussed, and I will share the Manhattan Community Board 1 and Manhattan Borough President's resolutions and recommendations on this project. The actions as described, oh, sorry, uh, next slide, please. The actions as described in October remain the same. The trust proposes to expand the Special Governor's Island District to the South Island, to create new controls pertaining to the South Island, and to change the underlying zoning on the South Island from an R32 to a C41 mid-density commercial district. The trust proposes these actions in order to allow the establishment of development of three, four, 34 acres with up to 4.275 million square feet of development and to allow a variety of uses such as academic and cultural institutions, research centers, commercial office space, hotels, and community facilities. The goal of these actions include promoting the use and enjoyment of the island as a regional destination for recreational and commercial activity, protecting and expanding the existing publicly accessible open space, and providing opportunities for development with connections to 
and appropriate relationships with the existing public open areas and historic district. Next slide, please. The proposed zoning map amendment will change the boundaries of the Governor's Island Special District to cover the entirety of the island and change the southern portion of the island from an R32 to a C41 as modified by the Governor's Island Special District. Next slide, please. The proposed text amendment will extend the boundaries of the existing special district to cover the entire island. Division Road, represented as the dashed line, acts as the boundary between northern and southern subdistrict. The existing zoning that applies to the northern subdistrict will remain unchanged. All newly proposed regulations as part of the text amendment apply to the southern subdistrict. The South Island um, is made of three distinct sub areas. Next slide, please. The open space sub area consisting of 46 acres is reserved for recreational and park uses. The Western sub area containing six acres and the Eastern sub area 27 acres collectively make up the 34 acre development site, which can be utilized for 2.98 FAR or 4.275 million square feet of development. Next slide, please. Here we see an illustrative assemblage of buildings shown here to demonstrate the provisions of the proposed zoning for the possible full build out of the development site. In the following slides, I will talk through the various full provisions that led us to this assemblage. Next slide, please. First, in addition to the public open space that the Esplanade and Park provide, there are several opportunities for additional open public spaces within the development site prescribed in the text. Yankee Pier Plaza, shown here in green, is a 25,000 square foot plaza located immediately adjacent to Yankee Pier at the northernmost portion of the Eastern Development Site. The plaza will act as the grand entrance, welcoming visitors to Yankee Pier, the new front door of Governor's Island. Next slide, please. Primary connections are publicly accessible pathways meant to function similar to public streets and that they could accommodate pedestrians and island vehicles. Primary connections will provide access across the development area connecting public spaces. Shown here in green is the general area in which a primary connection can be located. The exact configuration size of each development parcel will be determined by the location of the primary connections, which will act as the boundary line between parcels. So here is one possible configuration with primary connections being located within the bounds of the permitted area. With the primary connections defined, five parcels, W1, E1, E2, E3, and E4 will also be defined. Next slide, please. There are also requirements for secondary connections within four of the five parcels. These additional public connections would allow the public for, for, to further access and traverse the parcels. Next slide, please. We will now zoom into parcel E2 as illustratively defined in this scenario to illustrate the bulk and urban design controls in more detail and see how buildings are shaped by the proposed zoning text. As we can see, the boundaries of E2 will be defined by two primary connections, the Waterfront Esplanade and Yankee Pier Plaza. In other parcels, the South Island Park offers a boundary line. Primary connections must be a minimum of 60 feet wide and open to the sky. Next slide, please. There is broad flexibility of where a building might be placed on a parcel. If a building footprint, shown illustratively in blue, is offset from a parcel boundary, up to 50 feet, spaces between the building and the parcel is required to be public space. This is signified by the green area on this slide. Next slide, please. In addition, secondary connections must be provided across most parcels. The secondary connections shown here in yellow must be a minimum of 30 feet wide and are permitted to be covered or enclosed, provided they are at a minimum 30 feet tall. Next slide, please. In this view, we see an illustrative arrangement of buildings shows as many tools as possible in one configuration. Generally, different bulk rules apply to different planes above the parcel and the portions of buildings within those planes. Rules are separated in this way, so buildings appropriately respond to conditions at pedestrian scale and at upper portions of buildings. Permitted lot coverage is highest at the base portion and lowest at the upper portion. Building bases are generally required to be lower on the waterfront esplanade than on the South Island Park. In this way, we see density is generally pushed away from the waterfront and tapers upward. 
Overall building height is limited to 200 or 300 feet, depending on location, and all buildings are limited to 400 feet in length. Next slide, please. Thank you. Mechanical bulkheads are permitted on top of buildings as permitted obstructions, shown here in gray. Building orientation rules control towers. Towers are limited in permitted width the closer they are to the waterfront. As they move back away from the waterfront, they are permitted to be wider. Within 150 feet of the historic district boundary, coterminous with a northern and southern district boundary, no structure is permitted to be over 90 feet. Next slide, please. We'll now shift our view westward. Now we see the W1 development parcel in the western sub area. Again, this is an illustrative assemblage of buildings shown here to demonstrate to the commission the provisions of the repose zoning. As we can see, the same transition area requirement follow, follows over to the western development zone. The upper portion of the building in W1 is limited in size and location with regulations generally pushing a tower to the northeastern area of the parcel to ensure that the floor plate is appropriately scaled and oriented to promote views to lower Manhattan. Next slide, please. And then jumping back to the Eastern Development Zone, a few final urban design details to note. Articulation rules apply for every building frontage more than 200 feet in length. The street wall facing Yankee Pier Plaza has special rules in regards to street wall continuation and transparency. And transparency rules also apply uh, to the entrances of enclosed secondary connections, which is shown in orange. Next slide, please. So zooming out again, we see the full island with the full 4,275,000 square feet of development across both development zones shown in an illustrative assemblage. On a full scale, we see that the many bulk controls allow for flexibility and many varied building forms while ensuring the protection of ample open space and circulation space. Next slide, please. Here we see a breakdown of the proposed density by use. To note, the the FARs shown are calculated solely from the area within the development site, 34 acres. As noted at referral, previous studies related to park construction and the 2013 North Island rezoning described a South Island development of 1.6 million gross square feet. This projection was based on the scale of the former Coast Guard facilities on the South Island and was a density associated with this particular institutional use. The 2013 EIS described the 1.6 million gross square feet as illustrative for purposes of analysis. The trust attests that the scale of the development proposed as part of the current South Island zoning application represents what is needed to simultaneously attract a major anchor tenant and to create a critical mass of diverse uses that without permanent residential opportunities is needed to create a lively 24 seven year round district. To note, the existing deed currently prohibits certain uses such as heavy manufacturing, permanent residents, and casinos on the island. Therefore, the proposed residential use is proposed to enable the development of faculty residences and the like. Next slide, please. The trust notes that the desired tenant mix are uses consistent with those allowed in the island's deed, educational, nonprofit, and commercial facilities. Although no specific tenancies have been identified for the South Island, as there will be identified by a future public solicitation in an RFP process, the special district zoning was specifically tailored to support a mixed use 24 seven district. DCP and the trust remain in active discussions in regard to DCPs and city planning commissions ongoing consultation throughout the RFP process. And we will return to the commission post hearing to provide further details. Next slide, please. The proposed text allows up to 150 spaces of parking for both the Eastern and Western development site, allowing for a total of 300 parking spaces on the South Island. The trust states that they are committed to keeping Governor's Island a pedestrian and bike centric destination. Some vehicles are and will be needed for both to support the trust's operations, maintenance and security, and for similar need needs for future large tenants. The trust current operation requires maintaining a fleet of approximately 50 vehicles. Next slide, please. Proposed signage regulations will follow the rules of the underlying C4 district, except that no flashing signs are permitted. 
Next slide, please. Here we see the floodplain stretches across the two development zones. The proposed zoning for coastal resiliency tax will apply to the entire island. Later this afternoon, the commission will hear more details on the zoning for coastal flood resiliency proposal. Next slide, please. The text provides for various actions, some required in all development scenarios and some optional for relief. A chair certification is required before a potential developer can obtain building permits in order to establish the parcel locations, boundaries, elevation, and location of additional public spaces within. Further actions allow relief of provisions from the zoning. Next slide, please. A DSS GEIS was conducted with the Office of the Deputy Mayor of Housing and Economic Development acting as lead agency. The EIS identifies significant adverse impacts related to transportation. The transportation impacts are related to traffic, pedestrians, and transit. Regarding traffic, the environmental review identified the potential for significant adverse traffic impacts at 14 intersections, which could not be fully mitigated through standard mitigation measures. Additional mitigation measures will be identified in coordination with DOT in advance of the FSS GEIS. Regarding transit, the environmental review identified the potential for significant adverse impacts at three different stairways at varying peak hours at the Whitehall Street South Ferry Station. Additionally, potential impacts were identified at two stairways and one escalator at the Bowling Green Station. Discussions with New York City Transit are being undertaken regarding mitigation measures and will be described in the FSS GEIS. Finally, regarding pedestrians, Potential significant adverse impacts were identified for sidewalks, street corners, and crosswalks in Manhattan. No impacts were identified in Brooklyn. The majority of these impacted elements could be mitigated through standard measures. However, three sidewalks and 10 crosswalks could not be mitigated through standard measures, and additional measures will be identified in coordination with DOT in advance of the FSSGEIS. Next slide, please. On December 22nd, Manhattan Community Board 1 voted 26 in favor, 3 opposed, 7 abstained, and 2 recused on a resolution to disapprove the proposed applications unless conditions are satisfied. The full resolution with all conditions organized in the five categories listed here can be found in the Commission's briefing package. The conditions include, but are not limited to, the amendment or removal of use groups 12, 15, and 18, as well as amusement uses, non-maritime industrial uses, sewage removal, and marine transfer stations. The zoning must indicate the prohibition of permanent long-term housing, a reduction in the density, height, and bulk for the proposed development. The zoning text must clearly define limits of the base plane. The zoning must reduce the parking allowance on the two development zones. And the zoning must be amended to allow for a 45 day community board one comment period for land use actions such as city planning commission authorizations, certifications, and the establishment of new uses. The Trust for Governors Island has formally responded to community board one, acknowledging their conditions and committing to working toward a resolution on many of the outlined issues. The letter is included in the commission's briefing package and the trust team can elaborate at the public hearing. In the letter, the trust commits to further limiting permitted uses in the open space sub area and further reducing the height of permitted obstructions, as well as amending the methodology of the base plane measurement to provide clarity and predictability in development outcomes. In regard to the condition of the prohibition of permanent residential use, it is necessary to maintain the permitted existing 0.5 FAR of residential use as defined by zoning to allow for the deed permitted admission supportive uses, such as faculty residencies, artist residencies, and caretake of facilities. The trust understands Community Board One's concerns about the potential for future permanent residential housing after the year 2060, when this deed prohibition expires. Unfortunately, the zoning text with a broad definition of residential use cannot both allow for the development of the temporary residencies desired and permitted and also prohibit permanent residential uses. 
Therefore, the trust will be making a commitment to Manhattan, Manhattan Community Board 1 outside of the zoning text, confirming that this at this time, there's no intent to construct permanent housing after the deed prohibition expires, and further committing that after the expiration of the deeds use prohibitions in the year 2060, that any future proposal for new residential uses other than those currently permitted by the deed would be subject to robust public review and comment by Community Board 1. As the City Planning Commission requested, the application was also referred to Brooklyn Community Board 2 and Brooklyn Community Board 6. Community Board 6 held a public hearing, but neither Community Board passed a resolution on the proposed application. Next slide, please. The Manhattan Borough President held a public hearing on the proposed project on January 20th. The Borough President provided the Commission with a recommendation of disapproval of the application. The Borough President's recommendations echoes those concerns raised by the community, highlighting the desire for reduced building heights, resiliency planning in light of proposed uses, and the need to preserve those aspects of the island that make it great today, its existing tenants and pastoral landscapes. The full recommendations, as well as, the further, as, well as further details on the conditions of the recommendation can be found in the commission's briefing package. Next slide, please. So this concludes the presentation. Claire Newman, who made a special presentation to the commission on October 5th, as well as other members of the trust team, will be here to answer any further questions the commission may have on Wednesday, February 3rd at the joint hearing for the EIS and Euler. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Allison. Questions from the commission? Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, Allison. Um, Hi. Quick question. You mentioned um, transportation impacts. Could you unpack that a little bit? Because there's no, there are no map streets on the island. Isn't that correct? Correct. The transportation impacts um, identified were in regards to impacts in Manhattan and Brooklyn at uh, critical access points to access the ferry one would take to arrive at uh, Governor's Island. So, but what, what kind of impacts? Is it people gathering at the ferry? Is it tra traffic? What does that mean? Um, so the, the transportation impacts were related to uh, traffic and uh, pedestrians and transit. Um, uh, I can provide the commission with further details on the, uh, the environmental impacts in relation to transportation. Okay, I think it's meaningful because they mentioned their significant adverse impact. So I, I just like to understand that. Thank you. Absolutely. Vice Chair Knuckles. Uh, thank you. I, I noted that uh, the projected build out, if it were um, uh, actually done, would yield a, an FAR of 2.98. Uh, what is the FAR for a C4 zoning district? Um, that is an excellent question that, um, my apologies, I actually do not recall this off the top of my head, um, so I'll have to get back to you on that with the- I'm with confident the, uh, the that you will. I, I will. <laughs> my apologies. All right. If we could um, get that out in an email to the commissioners uh, before the public hearing so they're informed by that for the hearing. Absolutely. Thank you. Commissioner Bernie. Um, yeah, thanks, Alison. You know, just going back to that transportation question again, did anybody model um, what it would take to get people on and off the island with over 4 million square feet of development? I mean, under the present ferry system, it would take like several days to get the people on the island in the morning. So I'm wondering if they ever modeled that. Um, Yes, I think this is uh, something that I could provide in regards to the further information requested on the transportation impacts for the environmental analysis. Okay, thank you. I think it would also be helpful if the um, trust or some of their, um, their consultants who worked with them are able to answer that at the hearing on Wednesday. Commissioner Levin. Actually, I, there, I think there is some information on that in the um, 
EIS, they need ferry capacity of 9,000 passengers an hour, which is 15 trips an hour requiring 12 vessels. But um, some, you know, real life uh, narrative around that would be helpful from, from the trust because that's obviously a dramatic increase from where we are. Um, I had, um, I guess a question and a comment. Um, we're, I know we're gonna hear in the public testimony, we've already heard from board one and the borough president, um, uh, a lot of comment about the proposed heights of these buildings. Mm -hmm. um, as well as the density. And of course that's driven by the financial program that says you have to build so many square feet. But what, and, and, and um, I believe both um, the community board and the borough president are recommending a height limit of 125 feet. Correct. Um, is there, uh, what's the rationale for the 125 feet and what's the rationale for the maximum height that the um, trust is asking for? So the 125 feet matches the top of Liggett Hall, which is the tallest um, uh, building within the historic district on the island. Um, I think that on, when the trust comes on the third to present, they can elaborate on their desired height. Okay. Um, and then, so I guess just related to that, I have to um, uh, reiterate a comment that our former commissioner Michelle Deleuze had when this was certified, mm -hmm. um, which is that the vision here is really exciting, but it's really hard to assess this without knowing why it takes 4 million square feet um, mm -hmm. to be self-sustaining. And as Michelle put it, um, we need to pull the curtain back a little bit. Um, Board One has asked for more uh, detail about the financial modeling. Um, I would very much like to understand, it's really hard to respond to a rezoning request like this that will allow a certain scale of development without knowing why that scale of development is needed. So I really hope the trust can illuminate that for us as we go forward. The trust can speak to that on Wednesday, both from, uh, the, from the perspective of the planning rationale behind the proposed amount of density. Um, the commission also received a letter from the trust, I believe, uh, over the weekend um, in response to Commissioner Delahue's question about financial models. Oh, I, I don't know that I saw that. Is that, did that go up on box? Um, Someone can just I, double check and be sure we got, we get it. We'll double check that it, it got in your okay. Okay. It's okay. a constant response on the economics. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, we'll see this at the public hearing on Wednesday. Thank you. All right, the uh, seventh item on our agenda is a pre-hearing review of a citywide zoning text amendment. Our presenter is Manuela Poyadeco. Thank you so much, Ryan, and good afternoon, commissioners. I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, we can. Perfect, thank you. So I will start by doing a recap of Zoning for Coastal Flood Resiliency proposal, which is basically a summary of the information that we discussed in October 19th last year. And then I'll summarize the feedback we've been receiving from the public review process. Next slide, please. So while there are many sources of flooding that pose issues in New York City, coastal storms really present the most significant flood risk in terms of compromising human safety, property damage and business disruption. With 520 miles of coastline, New York City is very much a coastal city. So when we're analyzing the city's coastal risk, we really tend to focus on the area that FEMA designates as the high risk flood zone, the area that has 1% of chance of being flooded every year. However, in 2012, Hurricane Sandy awakened us to a more widespread risk by inundating well beyond that area. Close to half of the properties that are technically classified as being moderate risk of flooding or having a 0.2% chance of flooding were inundated. In the two year areas combined, we have almost a million New Yorkers living at risk of being flooded by a coastal storm. And with climate change, the floodplain will continue to expand. By the 2050s, today's modern risk flood zone will likely be high risk for flooding in the future. Next slide, please. So the city's floodplain includes a variety of neighborhoods that face different challenges when trying to stay safe and meet current flood risk regulations. In addition to being home to so many New Yorkers, 
The floodplain is also where many businesses critical to New York's economy and residents' daily needs are located. Next slide. So to the wide range of challenges that come with flood risk adaptation, we really need to pursue a strategy that involves multiple lines of defense. The city's work includes coastal defense strategies, protection of our inland infrastructure like drainage and transit, and advanced emergency preparedness. But today we are focusing on the tools we have to help advance the resilience of our building stock. Next. ZCFR, as you know, builds upon two text amendments that the city adopted post Hurricane Sandy on an emergency basis, the 2013 flood text and the 2015 recovery text. These rules are already expiring. The 2013 flood text is set to expire one year after the adoption of the new flood insurance rate maps by FEMA, which is targeted to be released in 2024. And the 2015 recovery text already expired on July of last, last year. If these rules are not made permanent, it could hinder the protection of existing vulnerable buildings and disincentivize resiliency measures in new construction, ultimately leading to less resilient neighborhoods. However, the CFR also builds upon lessons learned from the recovery process, proposing changes that reflect the feedback that we've received from more than 3,000 stakeholders, which are summarized in the outreach summary report. Ultimately, the CFR will be encouraging resilient buildings and would help those living and working in the floodplain to reduce damage from future coastal flood events, be resilient in the long term by accounting for climate change, and potentially save on long term flood insurance costs. It would also assist with disaster recovery by setting a framework for emergency situations, whether they be like Hurricane Sandy or the present situation with the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide. So I'll start with an overview of the proposal, which was presented at the project's referral. Next slide. So after our long process of studying the floodplain and engaging with so many stakeholders in the community on a wide set of issues, we were able to establish four overarching goals that help us move from sandy recovery to a longer term resilience strategy. The floodplain community told us that they want to be able to prepare buildings for flooding, even if they're not located in what FEMA determines to be the highest risk flood zone. People also want the option to raise their occupiable space a little higher than the current flood level that FEMA projects because they have seen higher flood levels already and expect the risk to grow in the future. Residents and business owners want to be able to invest in resilience incrementally, so it's more affordable over time. They want options like moving their mechanical equipment to a higher elevation without necessarily triggering a requirement to raise or fully flood proof the structure. And lastly, we know that we need a way for the city to be nimbler in responding to future events that might require rebuilding homes or even other forms of recovery. So now I'll provide a quick overview of each goal. Next slide. So starting with goal number one, this one speaks to the text applicability of the proposed regulations. It is important to note that these regulations are optional and will be facilitating buildings to meet or even exceed flood resistant construction standards set by FEMA and enforced by the city's building code in Appendix G. Next slide. The CFR would expand applicability of the current text to a broader set of buildings that are also exposed to flooding in the event of future coastal storms by allowing any lot located within both the 1% and the 0.2% annual chance floodplains to have access to the proposed special rules that help enable resiliency at the building scale. The 0.2% floodplain serves as a proxy for the high end projection of the 2050s 1% annual chance floodplain, allowing the city to advance resiliency in the longer term as it would allow those living in these areas to proactively undertake resiliency improvements, even if not required by the building code. Next slide. Regarding goal number two, the section illustrates regulations that will be available only if the building fully complies with Appendix G of the building code, and they're splitting, splitting to five separate subcategories. Next slide. So starting with the building envelope, the set of rules would allow building owners to physically elevate aptable spaces and other building support features above expected flow elevations by offering more flexibility with our bulk regulations 
Those are height, yards, and floor area. So buildings can be made resilient without putting homeowners in a hard spot of potentially having to choose between keeping their whole building versus making their homes resilient. Next slide. Regarding ground floor regulations, the set of rules would help promote good long-term resilient designs of buildings and how they meet the sidewalk. Through floor air exemptions, the proposed rules would encourage internal access and active uses to be capped at the sidewalk level as much as possible for floodplain communities to continue to be vib vibrant and accessible. Next slide. And just as a reminder, all these allowances can only be used if the building fully meets Appendix G to ensure that buildings meet the full resilience standards. In addition to that, to ensure resilient buildings also contribute to their surroundings, we would also be mandating that a set of streetscape requirements are met, so the ground floor level design of resilient buildings is improved. Next slide. And moving forward to speak about situations where neighborhoods and buildings may be old and not fully comply with our current zoning rules, leaving residents in these areas in a hard position when trying to undertake resilience improvements. An example of that are homes currently located on substandard lots, which may not comply with floor area or yard regulations. The proposal would set up a framework that would allow these and many other situations in which buildings do not conform with our use regulations or do not comply with our bulk regulations to be able to be retrofitted without bumping into zoning constraints. Next slide. And last, with such a vast and diverse building stock, in, uh, in the flow plane, we recognize that not all buildings in all situations will be helped by our as of right rules. Therefore, the proposal will continue to offer discretionary pathways in the form of BSA special permits to ensure that all unique situations are enabled to meet the standards for construction in the flow plane. Next slide, I'll talk about goal number three. So the set of provisions located within these four categories are what we call partial resilience strategies as they assist buildings undertake incremental steps towards resiliency without requiring the structure or sites to meet the full set of rules in Appendix G of the building code. Next slide. So we learned that raising mechanical equipment is often the first step to make buildings more resilient. And so the proposal would enable more options for the placement of equipment above the flood level, either on top of roofs, which is a common strategy for larger buildings or in a separate structure a common strategy for larger sites or smaller buildings that cannot accommodate the additional load of heavy equipment within the building. Next slide. A big portion of our flow plane contains businesses that offer either neighborhood services or are part of the large industrial economy of the city. Many of such businesses cannot really be completely elevated or dry flow proofed, and many therefore need to prioritize what kind of spaces will be raised above harm's way so such spaces can offer the necessary support immediately after a storm event and reduce the business disruption. So the proposal would include modifications to enable such measure. Next slide. The proposal would also enable different types of flood protection measures. Uh, this is one slide before this one. So go back one, please. Thank you. Um, flow protection measures will be able to be implemented ac across all areas in the flow plane. This would include allowances for flow panels and landscape burns and their associated egress systems to be considered permitted obstruction in open areas. It would also allow spaces used for the storage of flow panels to be exempted from floor area to enable on-site storage. Next slide. And last, uh, in goal three, in many areas of the city, zoning requires waterfront sites to provide waterfront access. In a wider range of sites at the water's edge, the grade of such waterfront yards or required visual corridors cannot be modified today. The proposal would continue to offer flexibility for grading, which was passed after the 2013 flood text, and facilitate other resilience measures such as soft shore lines to be designed to help account for sea level rise or by level esplanades. Next slide. So now I'll speak about our final goal, which differently from the previous regulations, they show rules that would apply mostly at the citywide level. Next slide. So Sandy showed us how a storm's effects can go beyond the floodplain, especially across our energy grid. 
The proposal would allow power systems, including generators, solar energy systems, fuel cells, batteries, and other energy storage systems to be considered permit obstruction in open areas across all zoning districts to facilitate their installment. Next. In addition to that, to ensure that all areas of the city can easily provide ADA access, the proposal will classify both ramps and lifts as permit obstructions in all required open areas to facilitate accessible designs. Next slide. And another important issue is how disasters, especially those that require the evacuation of residents, impact vulnerable populations. Nursing homes have populations that require continual medical care. And research show that this dependency can be strained whether nursing homes shelter in place or evacuate prior to a coastal storm. Therefore, the city believes it will be appropriate to limit the growth of nursing homes in high-risk areas to lessen the health consequences and logistical challenges of evacuating the residents of these facilities. The proposal would prohibit the development of new nursing homes within the high-risk area, the 1% chance floodplain, and other selected geographies that would have limited vehicular access during a storm event. Existing facilities in those areas would still be able to conduct enlargements for modest improvements, including those that help with resiliency. Next slide. Last, Sandy also showed us that a lengthy process to update zoning regulations can present obstacles to the necessarily fast-paced disaster response. The proposal would include rules that would be made available to facilitate the recovery process from future disasters, some of which would be implemented now to address with the COVID-19 pandemic and its associated economic effects. The first one would give property owners who hold special permits and authorizations an additional term so they can complete their original plan of construction on a longer timeline. The second one would support businesses that do not conform with zoning use regulations by allowing them more than two years, which is the current limit of discontinuance, to return to operations. Next slide, please. So now I'll be summarizing the recommendations that we've received during the public review process. Next slide. This proposal was referred out to all 59 community boards, all borough presidents and rural boards on October 19th. And while this is an only ULURP item, it followed the ULURP timeline alongside the resilience local actions, two of which are subject to the ULURP clock. That said, we've included recommendations received up to January 29th in this overview. I would also note that since this is an only ULURP item, it technically does not come with a requirement for votes to be categorized as yes or no, or yes or no with conditions, but community boards typically responded by signaling which box they would have checked, and in many instances, they provided recommendations. So we did categorize the feedback into favorably, favorably with conditions, unfavorably, and unfavorably with conditions. Next slide. So to summarize the recommendations, at the community board level until January 29th, we had 40 out of the 59 community boards submitting their recommendations. 24 of them voted favorably, 12 favorably with conditions, three unfavorably with conditions, and one unfavorably. All borough presidents and borough boards that submitted a recommendation voted favorably for the CFR with Manhattan and Queens establishing conditions. Overall, we've received over 60 conditions from community boards, borough boards, and borough presidents, most of which do relate to the zoning proposal, but a fair amount of them speak more broadly about resiliency. Next slide. I would also start by saying that several recommendations include statements in support of the citywide text amendment, recognizing that the proposed changes are one helpful piece of the overall strategy to tackle climate change and that they also help address coastal flooding. The proposal was endorsed as a positive step to allow residents and businesses more flexibility in preparation for future storm surge and help increase their ability to recover from such events especially since those may become more likely in the future due to climate change. ZCFR was also praised as an example of collaboration between city agencies and the community that a project is timely and necessary. A few boards also had specific statements, such as that the regulations related to wet and dry flow proofing flood air exemptions will allow for a more flood resistant community and that changes in the community due to resilience improvements are outweighed by the benefits for those most vulnerable, 
who are within locations at risk of flooding and who could therefore take actions to protect their lives. Next slide. In terms of the feedback, as I mentioned, many conditions received during the public review process do not directly relate to zoning. Those generally relate to the topics listed in this slide. I'd say that much of the conditions that cut vastly across the bureaus highlight that zoning is key, but not the sole tool required to achieve resiliency. They relate to the need for financial assistance programs in the form of low cost loans, subsidies and tax abatements in order to realize the outcomes the project is trying to achieve. Also, some of the few boards that voted unfavorably highlighted how this proposed rules without subsidies end up exacerbating inequities since it's easier for new construction to take advantage of the proposed zoning rules. Regarding flood insurance, it was encouraged that the city should further study the magnitude and nature of insurance savings that could be realized by building owners who retrofit their buildings to be more resilient and that those results are publicized to increase public awareness. A couple of comments related to infrastructure improvements, such as that the city should determine how to preserve parkland areas at risk of flooding and that coastal protection projects when built should be taken into account in the flood maps by FEMA. We can continue to provide more information to the city planning commission on, this, on those uh, items and others that may speak more broadly about the city's resilience efforts for context. But now for the rest of the presentation, I will focus on the items that more directly relate to the proposed action. Next slide. So the most commonly raised issues in public review that more directly relate to the zoning proposal were organized by the project's goals and main categories of rules. However, I will note that the vast majority of these conditions come from Manhattan boards and were echoed by the Borough Board and the Borough President. Next slide. Most conditions, they relate to applicability of the text amendment and those that relate to the ground floor regulations, building envelope and mechanical equipment. Now I'll go through all these items and summarize the conditions that were received in each specific category. Next slide. So starting with applicability, some boards had comments about updates to the flood insurance rate maps, firms for short, and had general note that the redefined floodplain could result in more areas of the board being included within the project's applicability. In a few instances, it was suggested that floodplain modifications should come for the community board for approval. One board in the Bronx had a specific comment about FEMA's update to the flood insurance rate maps, su suggesting that the update will occur in less than one year and therefore the proposal is premature. However, I would note that FEMA's target release date for the update is still several years ahead of us. Currently, the revised preliminary flood insurance maps is scheduled for release sometime in 2024, as I had mentioned, and therefore advancing the project at this time makes sense in order for the floodplain community to be able to start advancing resiliency in the longer term as soon as possible. Next slide. Generally, there is also recognition that the CFR does tackle issues related to the development of floodplain. However, because of climate change, one board in Manhattan wants to see development in vulnerable areas being reduced and redirected to more sustainable areas. Another board also suggested that a study should be made to determine appropriate density in high-risk areas, while others suggested that additional housing should only be added if it's secure that new residents can evacuate. There's also a general concern regarding how the CFR impacts special districts and uh, historic districts. Sorry, one slide uh, before this one, I jumped ahead of myself. Thank you so much. Some boards, they highlighted that those areas in special districts and historic districts have very specific rules to ensure very specific outcomes. And some suggested that building and retrofitting these areas should be subject to the city planning commission's approval. Starting with historic districts, comments came from Manhattan and go both ways. On one end, boards want to make sure that buildings in historic districts can be made resilient, worrying that LPC could pose restrictions that may hinder such retrofit strategies. On the other hand, there is fear of the impact of such resilience improvements in these areas, particularly regarding how height could impact the unique qualities of historic districts. Some boards requested that changes related to the building's design and envelope should be subject to LPC's approval and community board and borough president notification. 
while others do recognize that the CFR does not override LPC's rules, but still worry that it makes it easier for buildings to conduct work not usually supported by the board, such as relocating subgrade spaces within rear yards. Regarding special districts, there were mostly general concerns related to the potential impacts of the CFR rules within these areas. There's also concern in Manhattan regarding treating new and existing buildings the same way, especially regarding the height allowances and floor area exemptions. Their view is that it isn't actable to treat new and existing buildings the same way and recommended that new development shouldn't really get these rules. Next slide, I'll uh, explain this further. Basically, some boards in Manhattan and in the Borough Board recommended that new buildings shouldn't get any height relief. So this is the allowance for buildings to measure height from the flood resistant construction elevation, which has been in place since Hurricane Sandy. They also suggested that new buildings should not get the reference plane regulation, which is an update of a current rule in the 2013 flood text that bumps height uh, allowances in areas with high flood elevations. For existing buildings, one board also suggested that height should be limited to only the FRCE, the flood resist construction elevation, and not the reference plane. Another board in the Brewer board recommended that for those existing structures that have access to dry flow proofing floor air exemptions, which is uh, allowed in commercial corridors, that the height increase should be capped to one additional story or no more than 15 feet above the existing building. Next slide. So regarding floor area exemptions for spaces that are flood proofed, we had two boards made, making a recommendation that no floor area exemptions should be given to new buildings and that for existing buildings, the wet flood proofing floor area exemption should be capped to a maximum amount. The dry flood proofing floor area exemption was generally supported for existing buildings. I'll note that the suggestions are basically the current regime for the 2013 flood tax regarding floor area exemptions for spaces that are flood proofed since they only apply to existing buildings today, except that there is another flyer exemption that allows for even more space to be exempted than what the proposal allows for new construction. This is the one known as the salary exemption, which the CFR is actually proposing to delete to make sure that resilient buildings are not out of scale and with a bad and less resilient design. Next slide. I would also note that in contrast to this uh, request for existing Flyer allowances, a, a Queens Community Board recommended that the proposal should enable even more floor area to new and one and two family homes and altered residential structures, since below grade spaces are not allowed by Appendix G for residential structures. So regarding parking, uh, only one board made a parking related recommendation, highlighting that parking should be mandated within ground floors when fronting narrow streets that don't have parking on both sides of the street. Next slide. Regarding the proposed modifications to the existing BSA special permit, two boards suggested that to the extent possible, any foreseen special situations should be addressed in the zoning text itself rather than left to the BSA. The Manhattan Brew Board also recommends placing a maximum number of BSA and here they call them variances uh, for property. But I wanna just make sure that we are not uh, creating modifications to variances, but just updating the current BSA special permit and creating another BSA special permit. Next slide. Manhattan boards uh, generally shared also the idea that mechanical equipment, structures and buildings can consume the existing open space in dense Manhattan neighborhoods. The Brewer Board suggested that the MEP, the mechanical equipment allowances, should only be capped in low density areas. One board suggested that MEP buildings, which are being facilitated, especially in campus housing, need to come to the community board for approval. On the other hand, one board suggested that the MEP allowances could be available in high density districts, but only where it is structurally necessary to place MEP within open areas. Next slide. Regarding rules that give more flexibility for the relocation of important spaces above flood levels, one board raised the concern with the allowance for second stories to be used for non-residential uses and how that could impact affordable housing, most likely a concern that comes within the context of an existing mixed-use building with two uh, units within the second story being retrofitted. Next slide. 
So one Queens Community Board suggested that the waterfront yard should be widened beyond 40 feet to provide additional protection to upland areas. Next slide. Regarding power systems, uh, there's general support for en enabling the installment of power systems. However, one board in Manhattan raised the concern with allowing diesel generators and their potential impact on air quality and noise on rear yards. Next slide. Regarding vulnerable populations, many conditions in Manhattan and Queens related to the vulnerable populations item and more generally asked that we analyze if additional types of vulnerable populations beyond nursing homes should be considered when limiting developing the floodplain. One board worried that the opposite actually, that restriction of new nursing homes could hinder the expansion of such much needed use and recommended that instead risks should be mitigated by emergency protocols and infrastructure upgrades and not through zoning. Next slide. There were some questions regarding why the CFR is including rules related to other disasters beyond those that are flood related and mentioned the need for more guidelines that explain the invocation of the rules. One bar raised a concern with the COVID proposed item to allow more flexibility with discontinuous provisions of grandfather non-conforming uses due to noise issues with certain uses in residence districts. So this concludes the summary of the conditions received for the CFR. I just have one last slide regarding the environmental review. So a draft generic environmental impact statement was conducted with the Department of City Planning acting on behalf of the City Planning Commission as the lead agency. The notice of completion for the draft environmental impact statement was issued on October 16th of 2020. The EIS only identified the potential for unmitigated impacts for historic and cultural resources and hazardous materials. These impacts are typical for generic actions, which is a common uh, thing for citywide text amendments such as this one. Comments on the DEIS will be received by February 16th of 2021. Thank you so much for your attention. I can take any questions now. So thank you, Manuela, for taking an incredible array of information from the 59 community boards and presenting it to us in such a digestible form. Thank you. Questions? Commissioner Cirillo. I just want to ask a question that I don't recall um, and, and again, it, it, it may be there, but with respect to um, the opportunities this provides for the mechanicals and the power systems as, as defined, is there also some sort of a, um, guidance with respect to uh, pl planting or some disguise in the in the design ultimately of of this um, of, of the mechanicals because as important as this is given where they it might appear it, it could be something that stands out in a, in the public realm that would otherwise not fit in typically, um, and I just didn't know if we were also providing guidance for some sort of uh, uh, plantings or other opportunities for people to be able to have it there, but yet not have it be so obvious. Thank you so much for the question. It's a great question. Uh, we did add a, a couple of parameters for the installment of this uh, equipment, either the power systems or, or MEP equipment on the yards, open space, courts, and all the types of open areas that zoning requires. So for example, uh, in, if you are placing the equipment in a front yard, or you know, if you don't have a front yard requirement, but it's in the kind of front portion of, of the building, so from the building facade until the street line, we are requiring that uh, you have plantings in front of it to really mitigate exactly what you were talking about regarding you know, how you would perceive that from the sidewalk and the public realm. 
Uh, aside from that, uh, because one of, one of the main items we are also trying to enable through the proposal is the, the development of uh, or the installment of those buildings that can carry mechanical equipment for campuses. So those buildings, they can be quite, quite large. We've seen many of our sister agencies uh, doing that type of work with NYCHA and HPD. And one of the things we are also making sure is that those MEP buildings, the larger ones, they also have to mitigate the design by uh, meeting our points from the design uh, requirements that we have for any, any type of building, uh, any existing building that's retrofitting or being developed in the floodplain. So they also have to mitigate, uh, they have to comply with at least one point of that design uh, requirement. Okay, and at what point in, in, in the process is it um, affirmed that it was done? So who, who is left? Is that a, does it become a buildings department issue ultimately? Is there someone who confirms or affirms that, you know, not only are the mechanicals there or the power systems were there and that's legal, but that what is supposed to go around it is actually installed? Yeah, so uh, the permit will go directly to the Department of Buildings for approval. Um, the Department of Buildings have been already imposing design standards for uh, construction in general in the floodplain since Hurricane Sandy. So we did, you know, break those grounds uh, after Sandy by requiring design improvements. So they will be the ones carrying out that enforcement uh, when they receive a permit to elevate mechanical equipment on an open area they would also check that those design standards are met. Okay, thank you so much, Manuela, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Marin. Thank you, uh, Chair. Manuela, good afternoon, and thank you for the presentation. I do have one question, because I'm a little bit confused. I, and, and, and my confusion gets even thicker now that Commissioner Cirillo asked his question, because my understanding was that all mechanical equipment was supposed to be raised above the floodplain except in commercial places, is, is that correct? Um, where they couldn't be avoided. So I'm not, I'm missing out, somehow or the other missing a link here and making the connection with mechanical equipment in front of homes. Thank you so much, yeah. This is a, a question that, we com that comes to us all the time. Uh, so pursuant to Appendix G of the Building Code Regulations, you could indeed have uh, what we call a building, a non-residential building for flood zone purposes. This is a definition in Appendix G. You could have this typology, so a mixed use building, community facility, commercial, industrial, all with uh, mechanical equipment below the expected flood level, provided that they are dry flood proof or basically that they don't allow the water to come in uh, the, the equipment itself. Uh, they could be either enclosed within a dry flood proof space or just, you know, uh, they could resist the, the water pressure. Uh, but it's, uh, it's still from FEMA's guidance, uh, dry flow proofing, for instance, is not as uh, reliable as if you were to raise uh, an equipment. Um, so that's why, you know, it's really preferred that we have mechanical equipment being placed on top of roofs well beyond the, the flow levels or you know, raised on a platform uh, elsewhere. It doesn't have to be on the open areas if you have space in your footprint, which many of our zoning districts, they are you know, flexible enough. Uh, but especially if you have a building already there um, or you have a zoning district that has a more tight envelope with required yards and, and uh, open areas, then you may need to encroach a little bit into the area. And so that's why we are making sure that that's a possibility for all building types, even though they can, some buildings have other options. That makes sense and I understand. Thank you so much. That really clarified for me because I was, I was really confused. Having, having worked uh, post Sandy and having, having done the reconstruction of some homes and dealt with homeowners and businesses, you know, this is contrary to what we have done. So thank you for that, I appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions? Commissioner Levin. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, Manuela, did, um, did I hear you say that this would not override um, LPC rules? So what happens if in a historic district or, well, there are relatively few landmark properties, but there are historic districts. Um, within the area that would be affected by these rules. So what happens if someone uh, with a property in, in a historic district wants to apply these rules? 
That's another great question. Thank you so much, Commissioner. So basically, uh, from the types of items and resilient strategies that we are trying to enable with the project, so you know, it's either relocating spaces uh, from you know uh, below the flow levels or equipment and so forth. We believe that most of these uh, types of work will need to come to LPC for approval if it's a building, if it's a new construction or a building within historic districts or a landmark building itself. And so, landmark the landmark commission will still you know, have to approve that before it gets approved by the Department of Buildings. So the proposal is not changing that uh, framework. Uh, this is something we have already been experiencing since uh, Hurricane Sandy. And in fact, uh, since 1989, we have floodplain regulations. So it's been a couple of decades already. So we're not changing that framework. Um, it's understandable, you know, that uh, people have concerns with that, with that you know, especially because these buildings may have historic features. A lot of them, sometimes you have that on the roof. And so uh, that concern is raised when we're talking about, you know, elevating spaces, elevating equipment and so forth. But LPC really revises this on a case by case basis and they may pose additional uh, barriers uh, or not barriers, but additional conditions beyond zoning. And we're not changing that, uh, that work basically. Um, yeah, so, so, so in that situation, you have, um, when it comes to the tension between the desirability to implement these features and provide for future resiliency, and the desirability of preserving historic structures, um, you at least have the LPC um, as an agency prepared to consider and balance those, those tensions. Mm -hmm. um, but in special zoning districts, those also are areas where um, in some cases there are um, public policies reflected or zoning policies reflected that define a, a shape of buildings or streetscapes. Um, why the decision then here to just let these new rules override those policies in special districts? Thank you without, also, yeah. Without, without um, you know, re referring it in some way to an arbiter who can balance in the individual case mm -hmm. the policies underlying this text and the policies underlying the special district. I see. No, yeah, great question also. Uh, it's so the same way that I was explaining how the project works with historic districts, it's true for special districts in terms of what we've been doing since, you know, 1989 and uh, with the uh, changes there with height and floor area. And then also since Hurricane Sandy, in which we added even further allowances on the CDY level. So we already have that procedure. Uh, so the proposal was trying not to change that, uh, really with the idea that everyone should have the option of being made safer. And if a building bumps into zoning constraints and have to go through other you know, discretionary actions, pursue the BSA special permit, and other things like that, it could really hinder the ability of property owners to incorporate these changes. So the proposal was just trying to keep something that's already in place. Uh, we did look into uh, you know, the special districts. We have language actually in the, in the proposed zoning text that clarifies when the proposal is applicable to that. Um, so if, everything that we have in Article 6, uh, which is you know, special regulations for special locations, it's already the framework of the zoning resolution that those supersede special districts um, because we're trying to, in this case, enable resiliency across the board. Um, so yeah, we did look into those. Uh, also, I think that there may be um, a, a, lot, a lot of questions you know, in people's head when they come from an area that do have this very specific rules that were passed for a reason, like you said. Um, and, and, and so like, the, I think that the goals that we are trying to achieve the project doesn't really conflict in a bad way with the special districts, uh, especially when it comes to the floor area exemptions, because we're trying to really, you know, in, yeah, we have a lot of special dis districts that have used regulations at the sidewalk level to ensure that vibrancy and that, you know, streetscape. And this project also has the same goal and in, in with the understanding that the regulations that come from FEMA in the appendix G of the building code, that is what adds a little bit of conflict into 
that experience in the public realm. And so the proposal is trying to counterbalance that by giving the flexibility that's necessary for that, those streets to continue to be vibrant in the same way that special districts uh, really envision. So we don't think it's a conflict, uh, but we, we did welcome you know, specific situations in which we should look further. Okay, thank you. I'll go, look, I'll go focus on the text a little bit more, but thank you for that. Thank you so much. Other questions? Okay, then, um, thank you again, Manuela, for your encyclopedic knowledge of this complex proposal, and we will see it at the public hearing on Wednesday. Thank you so much. Hi. The eighth item on our agenda um, is a pre-hearing review for zoning map and zoning text amendments in Brooklyn Community District 15. This is a local resiliency action, um, and our presenter is Catherine Richard. Hello, good afternoon. Um, so I'll be presenting on two local resiliency actions in Brooklyn that are returning to the CPC today. First up is Resilient Neighborhoods Garrison Beach. Um, and here DCP is seeking a zoning map amendment and zoning text amendment. The project was referred out for public review on October 19th, 2020 at the same time as DCFR. Next slide, please. Garrison Beach is located in Community District 15 in Brooklyn. It's marked in orange on the, uh, in the map on the left and very close by Merchant Green is Sheepshead Bay, which is the site of the second local resiliency, resiliency action in Brooklyn. Uh, Garrison Beach was studied as part of DCP's Resilient Neighborhoods Initiative and the proposed actions were developed in consultation with local elected officials and a community advisory committee whose members included representatives from Community Board 15, the Garrison Beach Property Owners Association and Garrison Beach Cares. Uh, it is a residential neighborhood predominantly characterized by single family detached homes. The project area is currently zoned R4 with C3 zoning on the waterfront and C12 and C22 commercial overlays on Garrison Avenue. Garrison Avenue is also the only street that provides access to the entire neighborhood. Next slide, please. Some of the unique built conditions in Garrison Beach have implications for flood risk and resiliency. These include bungalows originally built for seasonal use now being occupied as permanent residences, narrow street widths, narrow lot widths, sunken lots with residential uses below the DFE, multifamily development being permitted in a neighborhood vulnerable to coastal flooding and with only one main road for egress, and businesses useful in flood preparation and recovery not being permitted by the current commercial overlays. Next slide, please. These neighborhood characteristics combined with Garrison Beach's physical flood risk make the neighborhood particularly vulnerable to coastal flooding. The majority of Garrison Beach is within the 1% annual chance floodplain or A zone. And some portions of the waterfront are in the coastal A zone and subject to moderate wave action. Next slide, please. Um, a zoning map amendment and zoning text amendment are proposed to address these resiliency challenges. The zoning map amendment would replace the existing R4 zoning with R41 zoning, replace C3 zoning with C3A zoning, and replace the Garrison Avenue C12 and C22 commercial overlays with a C23 overlay. The zoning text amendment would establish a Garrison Beach Special Coastal Risk District. Next slide, please. In the proposed R41 and C3A districts, no new attached or multifamily development would be allowed. Reduced side yard requirements would allow for a more efficient building layout and more contextual flood resistant development in Garrison Beach. Under C3A, the existing mix of water dependent and residential properties would remain in conformance with zoning and would not face obstacles from zoning regulations if they were to undergo resiliency retrofits in the future. The new C23 overlay would permit expanded commercial and retail services, including home maintenance and repair that would be useful in disaster recovery and rebuilding. The commercial overlay depth would be reduced to front only Garrettson Avenue and the underlying zoning in this area would remain R4. Next slide, please. The proposed special coastal risk district for Garrison Beach would modify the R41 and C3A district regulations to further restrict the density and scale of future residential development. Only single family detached houses would be permitted on lots less than 3000 square feet. On larger lots, two family development would still be permitted. Um, residential building height would also be limited to 25 feet above the reference plane. Next slide. 
On November 17th, Community Board 15 held a public hearing and vote for Resilient Neighborhoods Garrison Beach, along with um, the citywide text and the Sheepshead Bay project, um, and voted unanimously in favor. Um, the Brooklyn Borough President held a public hearing on November 30th. Um, the Borough President's office asked two questions about financial support for homeowners who are interested in undertaking these resiliency retrofits and the Borough President's office recommended approval without conditions on January 21st. There's a typo, I'm sorry, that should say 2021, not 2020. Um, that's the presentation and I can answer any questions. Questions from the commission. Okay, well, we will then see this at the public hearing on Wednesday. All right, the ninth item on the agenda is a pre-hearing review for a zoning text amendment. Um, also in Brooklyn Community District 3 and Catherine will present on this as well. Thanks. Um, so Resilient Neighborhoods uh, Sheepshead Bay uh, was referred out for public review on October 19th. Um, and here DCP is proposing a zoning text amendment. Next slide, please. Sheepshead Bay is located southwest of Garrison Beach along the Sheepshead Bay water body and north of the Manhattan Beach neighborhood on the Coney Island Peninsula. The area is almost entirely within the 1% annual chance floodplain. The Sheepshead Bay Resilient Neighborhood Study was released in May 2017 after several years of work with the Community Advisory Committee, Community Board 15, and community organizations. Through this outreach, DCP found that the special Sheepshead Bay District presents unique conditions and zoning requirements that were not fully addressed uh, through the citywide approach of CCFR. Next slide, please. Uh, much of the area is residential with active commercial corridors, including Sheepshead Bay Road, anchored by the Sheepshead Bay BQ subway station and Emmons Avenue in the special Sheepshead Bay district. The underlying zoning regulations for floor area ratio, building height and setback and use are modified by the special Sheepshead Bay district. Next slide. Created in 1973, the Special Chiefs Head Bay District regulations promote water related commercial uses and new public open space. The special text allows for floor area bonuses in certain, uh, in certain areas for developments that provide open space on site, but there's minimal guidance on how those spaces should be designed and maintained and there's no consideration for flood risk or resiliency of those public spaces. For example, there is an allowance that plaza spaces, which may be entirely paved, can be sunken up to two feet below a grade, which creates a drainage issue and flood risk. Next slide, please. Um, and here's an example of how some of those sunken conditions exacerbated the effects of flooding during Hurricane Sandy. Next slide. The text amendment aims to encourage flood resilient and active design of public spaces where the special district requires or encourages them through bonuses. The applicability is limited only to special district subdistricts A, C, D, E, and F. Specifically, the text amendment would require plazas to be located at or above grade, would improve the consistency of public spaces across the district by consolidating what are now different types of open space bonuses, would eliminate a bonus for arcade spaces or covered walkways, which tend to produce enclosed spaces that don't support the goal of commercial activation, and would set clear and improved standards for how future plazas are designed to ensure that they are accessible, provide elements like seating, trash bins, drinking fountains, and have plantings that are tolerant to occasional saltwater flooding. Next slide, please. So this drawing shows um, an existing hardscaped open space with minimal planting, um, what that space could look like under the proposed uh, conditions. This is just illustrative. There's no planned redevelopment of this site or any other sites that would be affected by these regulations at this time. Next slide, please. Community Board 15 held a hearing and vote on November 17th with Garrettson Beach and the, uh, the citywide text. Um, and voted unanimously in favor for Resilient Neighborhoods Sheepshead Bay. Um, the Brooklyn Borough President briefly discussed Resilient Neighborhoods Sheepshead Bay in their public hearing for Garrison Beach on November 30th, um, and the Borough President submitted a recommendation to approve without conditions on January 21st. And we can answer any questions. 
And questions from the commission. Okay. Another item for our public hearing on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. The 10th item on our agenda is a pre review of a zoning map amendment in Queens Community District 2, and it rounds out our resiliency package. Our presenter is Joy Razor. Hey, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, <clears throat> there's Light Neighborhoods, Old Howard Beach rezoning is the Queens local action in Community District 10, returning to the commission after it was certified alongside CCFR on October 19th. DCP is the applicant seeking a map amendment in this neighborhood. Next slide, please. Old Howard Beach is a neighborhood that was deeply impacted by Hurricane Sandy in 2012. And as Manuela mentioned, the city has done a lot of work since then to ensure that coastal communities are better protected against flooding. Following Hurricane Sandy, DCP advanced a temporary emergency citywide text amendment, which was updated in 2013 and 2015 to promote rebuilding to higher resiliency standards. In 2014, DCP launched the Resilient Neighborhoods Initiative to work directly with coastal communities that were devastated by Sandy. The 2017 Old Howard Beach, Hamilton Beach, and Broad Channel Resilient Neighborhood Study built on that work, providing zoning recommendations specific to unique neighborhood conditions and risks, which for Old Howard Beach included enacting targeted zoning treatment to reflect the neighborhood's unique character and long-term vulnerability, updating zoning to make it easier to retrofit buildings and advancing infrastructure and coastal protection strategies. The proposed rezoning aims to achieve these goals while also leveraging ZCFR provisions to increase flexibility for resilient construction. Next slide. Old Howard Beach is outlined here in white and is serviced by the A train at the Howard Beach JFK Airport Station. It's a waterfront community north of Jamaica Bay bounded by Shellbank Basin to the west and Hawtree Basin to the east, making it susceptible to flooding. Next slide, please. As you can see from this map, Old Howard Beach is largely within the 1% annual chance floodplain or the high risk flood zone. Portions of Old Howard Beach to the north are within the 0.2% annual chance floodplain or the moderate risk flood zone. The neighborhood was completely inundated by Sandy with most streets experiencing an average of three to six feet of flooding. Next slide. Old Howard Beach consists of predominantly low rise residential buildings, the majority of which are detached single and two family homes. Nearby Hamilton Beach and Howard Beach are also predominantly low rise residential neighborhoods and Cross Bay Boulevard to the west is the area's major commercial corridor and serves as the north south artery. The current zoning within the proposed rezoning area is R32 to the north and R31 in the wider neighborhood. The zoning has remained largely unchanged since its adoption in 1961. Next slide. The slide reflects the housing typology that exists under the neighborhood's current zoning. As mentioned, the majority of the area is R31, which is reflected in the detached homes you see in the top right. Some of these homes have already been elevated to be more flood resilient. Homes along Huron Street shown in the bottom right are typically semi-detached in nature and are single or two family duplexes, most common in the R32 district to the north. Semi-detached buildings are harder to retrofit to meet resiliency standards. Next slide, please. The proposed rezoning includes a map amendment that you can see outlined in orange and yellow, affecting 48 blocks and 1,037 residential buildings in the area. The proposed rezoning would change the current R31 and R32 districts into a single R3X district. The R3X zoning would better reflect the typology of the existing housing stock, which consists again of predominantly single and two family detached homes. The proposed zoning would not produce a large difference in what's currently permitted with the FAR maximum height and parking requirements all remaining the same. The largest difference would be in the permitted housing typology. Along Huron Street to the north, outside the 1% annual chance floodplain, the current R32 district would be rezoned R31, which is the lowest density district allowing for semi-detached single and two family residences and would ensure that this housing typology characteristic of the street remains in compliance. However, the future construction of small multifamily apartment buildings would be permitted. And again, uh, the FAR complete and parking requirements would all remain the same. The largest difference would be in permitted housing typology. Next slide. 
On December 3rd, Queens Community Board 10 voted unanimously in favor of the proposal with the following conditions. That no future development of community facilities with sleeping accommodations be permitted, and that all other restrictions listed in the Special Coastal Risk District text be applied, including floor area limits and maximum floor area ratios for zoning lots containing residential and community facility uses. Next slide. The agency has considered the recommendations and I've uh, provided some responses below. In regards to the first point, as Manuela had mentioned earlier, nursing homes are licensed to house populations that require continual medical care, which puts them at risk whether residents shelter in place or evacuate prior to a coastal storm event. Community facilities in general, such as psychiatric and other health facilities, generally do not serve a resident population that experiences negative health and morality outcomes when subject to evacuation. And after much consideration and research, DCP does not believe that this restriction should be expanded to community facilities beyond nursing homes. In response to the second recommendation, the agency conducted extensive outreach and research during the neighborhood planning process to determine the appropriate zoning treatment for Old Howard Beach. A map amendment rather than a special coastal risk district is being proposed because the neighborhood's slightly higher elevation wider and more regularly sized lots and lower susceptibility to daily tidal flooding as compared to Hamilton Beach um, makes more sense for this text or this map amendment. Um, next slide, please. To highlight the last point, um, this slide compares the extent of daily tidal flooding based on sea level projections in the image on the right. And you can see that these 2050s projections show severe tidal flooding in the majority of Hamilton Beach with Old Howard Beach projected to experience less daily tidal inundation. Last, uh, next slide, please. In summary, Old Howard Beach is particularly vulnerable to storm surges and flooding due to its position along the Queens coastline. The proposed down zoning would work in tandem with the ZCFR citywide text amendment to bolster resiliency efforts by limiting future development to housing types that are easy to retrofit and build to resilient standards as well as retaining the existing neighborhood character. This concludes my presentation and I'm now available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Questions from the commission. Okay, so this will be our fourth resiliency item at Wednesday's public hearing. Thank you. So for February 3rd, 2021 staff have prepared reports for uh, 737 Fourth Avenue rezoning, uh, 9114 Fifth Avenue rezoning, East Harlem URP extension, 65 Spring Street, and they've also we've also scheduled for a decision on Wednesday 21432 Hillside Avenue. Are there any questions on those? Raise your hand. Let us know. Okay. Uh, for post hearing, we have the Harlem cluster sites, uh, 6163 Crosby Street and 5 Mercer Street. If there's any further questions on those, we can get staff on that. Not seeing any raised hands. Uh, on the Flatiron bid expansion, uh, there was a letter in your package addressing some of the questions that came up at the hearing. Um, I guess I would ask if there are any further questions on this. All right, I don't see any raised hands on that. Seems like we've addressed the concerns. On 69 Adam Street, uh, Josh Vogel is here to discuss. Josh. Thanks, Ryan. Good afternoon, commissioners. So this is a post hearing follow up for an application submitted by the Department for Citywide Administrative Services for disposition of non residential city owned property to facilitate the development of commercial office space in a mixed use building in the Dumbo neighborhood of Brooklyn Community District Two. next slide please. The application was certified on October 5th 2020 and the public hearing was held on January 20th. Following the public hearing, the borough president submitted his recommendation, which I will summarize. And in addition, I'll provide the applicants follow up responses to questions posed at the public hearing. Next slide, please. 
The borough, Brooklyn Borough President held a remote public hearing on November 30th, 2020. On January 20th, 2021, the borough president recommended to disprove the application with conditions, which include the following that the city clarify which Dumbo properties DOT will continue to operate and which could be converted into publicly accessible open space. That the proceeds of the development rights to 69 Adams fund the following. Accessibility improvements at the York Street subway station, capital projects at the NYCHA Farragut houses, public realm improvements at DOT's Dumbo properties and a Dumbo traffic study. The borough president recommendation also discusses resiliency and sustainability measures such as blue roofs, passive house design, and solar panels, pedestrian safety and accessibility improvements, including a curb extension on Adams and Front Street, and setting aside below market commercial space for local arts, cultural, and nonprofit entities. The applicant has provided the following responses to questions posed at the public hearing and to some of the borough president's conditions. In response to the DOT properties, the applicant team has had ongoing conversations with DOT regarding the lots that are part of the project area. DOT maintains that these lots are critical for their operations, specifically for the maintenance of the Manhattan Bridge above, and also for storage and staging of repair materials that serve wider operations across the city. The lots are also conveniently located adjacent to DOT's metal shop on Front Street and close to the BQE. Should DOT identify opportunities to activate the site, the developer has agreed to provide support to repurpose the space. And in response to the York Street subway station, the environmental review found no adverse impact created by the project related to transportation. That said, EDC is working with the MTA, the lead agency responsible for the York Street subway station to identify opportunities to support future improvements. With regards to local hiring, the commission asked that the city commit funding to meet the 50% local hiring goal under Hire NYC, especially for those with barriers to employment. The developer is obligated to participate in the Hire NYC program for both construction and permanent operations. Under Hire NYC, the developer will target people living below two times the NYC poverty level for half of all the permanent jobs created by the developer and future tenants. This obligation will be maintained for eight years after the building opens. In response to driving outcomes related to local hiring goals, the developer is currently engaging NYCHA's Office of Resident Economic Empowerment and Sustainability, which receives city funds on job training and marketing efforts. They are in, currently in conversation with NYCHA to develop pathways to connect residents with job opportunities, particularly, particularly for residents of nearby developments, including Farragut, Whitman, and Ingersoll houses. They have started the process of determining how outreach will occur to ensure residents are aware of the job opportunities in construction, permanent operations, and with future tenants, as well as how to connect them with, to training opportunities that prepare them for these jobs. And in response to a question regarding the methodology that will be used to identify minority and women-owned business contractors and labor force, under the development rights sales agreement, the developer is required to commit to a 30% MWBE goal for its construction budget. The developer must submit an MWBE contracting plan prior to construction and has committed to engaging a workforce consultant to assist with identifying qualified MWBE contractors and material suppliers. Per the agreement, the developer will be required to report its progress toward the 30% goal throughout the bidding and construction process. And these applicant responses were also detailed in a memo that was included in your briefing package. And that includes the post hearing update. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, Brian, if you want to continue. Looks like Commissioner Bernie has his hand up. Sorry, I did, did not see that. Sorry, yes, please. Sorry, I did it late, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Josh. Um, I just a quick question. The borough president talks about what is the disposition of the money for the sale of the, what are they doing with the proceeds from the disposition of the site? Do you know, A, how much money that is, and B, what the city typically does with that money? It's going into the general fund. Um, and no, we don't know the exact um, amount yet. It will be uh, uh, appraised on, by fair market value uh, following the application. Oh, so they determine that after they, or when they, during the sale proceeds. Correct. Okay. 
I mean, it seems like the borough president has a fair point that if we're adding um, bulk and density to the area, that some of that money should go to mitigate the impact of that. And I must say, to say that there's no adverse impact on the York Street station just weakens my confidence in the EIS process because <laughs> I've used that station many times and it could definitely use some improvement and it'll only be exacerbated by more people using it. So that's my opinion. Noted. Hardly the uh, most beautifully maintained station in the city, in the system. Mm -hmm. On Auburn East, uh, there was a letter in your package and, and staff, are, you're here if there's any further questions um, or any follow-up. I don't see any hands raised on that either. Okay. Uh, on 91 63rd Drive rezoning, um, again, I'd ask if there are any further questions. Staff are, can address those. Okay. On 5025 Barnett Avenue rezoning, uh, there was your a letter in your package. And I believe, I don't, Scott, did you want to say anything? I don't think we needed to. I thought the letter was pretty comprehensive on that. Okay. I'm just here if there was any questions. That's right. Okay, not seeing anything further. No, but, but grateful to have the information. Thanks. For, I'm glad right. yeah. It was um, all right. Uh, 24501 Jamaica Avenue rezoning. Uh, I will I will say bluntly, I'd be surprised if there's any further questions on that. And uh, oh, here we go, Anna, proving me wrong. No, not not a question, <laughs> but just a just a comment. I do hope that our report will acknowledge the concern that the community had about the potential for a hotel um, being located there and the discussions. You know the arrangement they've come to with the applicant, which is nothing that we can enforce as a matter of zoning. But I think, for the record, our report ought to reflect that that um, you know the things that the uh, um, applicant has indicated. Certainly, that Commissioner, we can draft some language and have that in Good, the, thanks. In considerations. Yes, and uh, the Forty Fourth Avenue demapping, last but hardly least. Okay. Okay, well, I hope that um, all of us tap into our remaining inner child and go out and make some snow angels. All right, this concludes the review session for Monday, February 1st, 2021, and the time is 3.38. Thank you. Uh, stay warm. Thank, Thank you. Be safe, everybody. Okay, bye-bye.